Good afternoon. Um, my name is Deandra Durand. I'm a program assistant with the Russell Sage Foundation. I see we have roughly about 50 people um, on this call. So I believe we can just go ahead and get things started. Um, as I mentioned, I am a program assistant with the Russell Sage Foundation. I'm going to allow my colleagues to also introduce themselves before we begin this meeting. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Stephen Glauser. I'm a senior program officer at the foundation. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya. I'm a program assistant with RSF. Uh, before we get into the meat of things today, I have a few housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, number one, the meeting's being recorded and you'll have access to the recording um, after we're finished. Um, there's a Q&A section that we'd like you to use if you have any questions. Regarding these questions, please refrain from asking specific project-related questions during the talk. Um, if we don't get to your question, you can reach out to us after the talk at programs at rsage.org. Um, our overview today, we'll do a little history of RSF. We'll talk about our funding priorities in our current programs uh, and talk about the funding mechanisms, namely our core research grants, our early career grants, and other funding mechanisms that we have. And then we'll go into our application and review process. Okay, um, as a quick overview of the history of our foundation, um, the Russell Sage Foundation was was founded by Margaret Olivia Sage, who was the widow to um, a Russell Sage, um, known for making his wealth in finances and other industries. Uh, and Russell Sage Foundation had basically two eras uh, of its history. The first era from its foundation in 1907 to 1944 um, was really direct impact um, and more, more direct work and to support institutions, um, so institutional support and poverty reduction. And um, after 1944, the foundation shifted its focus away from direct service uh, and more towards research and really um, towards social science research in an effort to strengthen methods and data for the theory of social sciences. And um, and the whole point of the foundation as well um, for the improvement uh, of the social and living conditions in the United States. So primarily this foundation uh, strives to improve the social sciences um, within US related research topics. So I'll give a quick, quick overview of our program areas. Uh, first, as a note, each of these program areas has an RFP that lists example research questions uh, that, we, that we are interested in uh, on our website. Uh, those research questions are not exhaustive. They are not limited. We are not only interested in the questions that we list in the RFPs. They are to just give you a sort of example uh, but I highly recommend you looking at each of the RFPs for each of the program areas, especially the ones that you're interested in. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that we also recognize that there's a lot of overlap between our, our, our program areas uh, and that uh, when you're thinking about which one to apply to, you can send us a quick email and be like, hey, I'm thinking of applying to this one versus this other one, but it could really be in both. Uh, and we can give you some guidance over which one it'll be the best fit for. Um, so our core program areas, these are long-standing uh, program areas, long-term ones. Uh, uh, we have four of them right now. We have one called Behavioral Science and Decision-Making in Context. Uh, that really evolved out of our previous program on behavioral economics. Um, I like to say shorthand for this is uh, behavioral, behavioral economics for non-economists. So, or we sort of realized that other people were interested in doing behavioral science. And so we should have the title of it reflect that. Um, we have a program area on the future of work. We've had it since 1994. So um, we're the future of work hipsters in terms of the foundation world. Everyone else started there as much later than us. Um, in that program, we're interested in anything that pretty much anything that has to do with the labor market. It can be anything like the effects of AI and automation on the workforce. It can be uh, looking at things like monopsony power. Um, it can be looking at uh, 
uh, just questions about like uh, if we uh, questions about how the uh, the effects of raising the minimum wage or something like that. Uh, other things like uh, worker power unionization, all of those things go into the future of work program. Um, we have next is our program on race, ethnicity, and immigration. Uh, this used to be two separate programs, uh, one called cultural contact and one called immigration, but we combined the two of them. Uh, and uh, here we're we're sort of interested in. Uh, the the population of the U.S. how we how we interact with each other how we integrate new new populations into into the U.S. Um, and things like that. Uh, but uh, it's a pretty broad area, and you'll see that there's probably a lot of uh, overlap between say that program and our next program, which is on uh, social, political, and economic inequality. Uh, this this grew out of our former program on social inequality, but we wanted again to show the breadth of interest. Uh, we are not just interested in social inequality, we are interested in inequality more broadly. Um, but again, there's clearly some projects that are gonna fall within both the inequality and the race and ethnicity and immigration uh, topic areas. If you're looking for some uh, guidance, please reach out and email, email us for uh, some ideas about which programs that you fit best in. Um, for the behavioral science uh, program, we we are not just looking at uh, decision making in any sort of any sort of capacity. We really want those behavioral science and decision making projects to intersect with our other program areas, um, and that would be uh, those projects will be much more of interest to us. On the right hand column here, we have some special initiatives. These are more short term interests uh, that we're really trying to drive some funding to. Uh, that does not mean we're not interested in these topics long term. It just means like we're particularly interested in them right now. Uh, so first, we have uh, an initiative on immigration and immigrant integration. Um, clearly, all of these sort of fit in our race, ethnicity and immigration program, but we're really interested in uh, the integration of immigrants into US society. Um, and so we have a specific pot of money co-funded with the Carnegie Corporation, uh, where we're looking at research projects in that area. Again, that initiative has its own RFP on our website as well. And then we have a very long-winded uh, initiative, uh, promoting educational attainment and economic mobility among racially, ethnically, and economically diverse groups after the 2023 Supreme Court decision to ban race-conscious college admission policies. Um, you can see that that uh, mouthful is co-funded with the Hewlett Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and the W.T. Grant Foundation. And when you have that many foundations working together, that's how you get such a long name. Uh, but essentially, we're interested in how uh, places are reacting to the ban on affirmative action and uh, what that looks like for diversifying places like colleges and other 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 spaces uh, in 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 this present context. All right, you can go to the next slide. Within those program areas, there are some things that we are particularly interested in funding and some that we generally are less interested in funding. Uh, so um, as we've mentioned before, we are we are a foundation that focuses on the US. So we are uh, we would like there to be, uh, there are occasionally uh, exceptions to this, uh, like if work cannot be done in the US for some reason, uh, the example I usually go to is like uh, because something doesn't exist in the U.S., like uh, like universal health care or or something like that. So there or a multi-party democracy or something like that. Like, uh, but in general, uh, things that are focused on the U.S. Uh, and uh, sometimes we do comparative work. We would be interested in funding the U.S. portion of a study like that, something like that. Um, we are interested in uh, newly available data, novel use of existing data. Uh, the linkage, linking of data sets, uh, we're interested in original data collection that can be anything from uh, field experiments, survey experiments, uh, uh, representative surveys, in-depth qualitative interviews, ethnographies, a uh, whole bunch of different uh, research methods across the various social sciences um, are of interest to us. Um, now, because we there are a lot of other sort of research foundations, well, and we're trying to sort of stay in our lane and not step on other toes and not duplicate efforts, um, we do not generally fund work that focuses on health or mental health outcomes. Um, th that the, uh, that means them as the primary outcome. If they if those outcomes are among the outcomes you're looking at, uh, that would still that could still be, potentially be of interest. Um, and also, there are some projects where health or mental health uh, issues are on the other side of the equation, and those things lead to various 
social, political, or ec economic inequalities. I could imagine a project like that also being of interest to the foundation. Um, if you're sort of curious about where your project falls on that line, uh, we really encourage you to reach out to us at programs at rsage.org. And we can set up, we can have an email back and forth. If you send us a, an abstract, we can set up a time to chat. Um, and we can sort of give you some guidance about whether the work you're doing is a good fit for the foundation. In that same vein, uh, there are some educational outcomes that we are less interested in. These include uh, work looking at educational processes, teacher outcomes, uh, curriculum development. We tend to send folks who are interested in those things. We tend to suggest that you go to a place like the Spencer Foundation or, uh, or something like that. And then finally, um, if there's a publicly available data set that you are not manipulating very much and you're just downloading it and uh, doing a routine analysis, like running regressions on it, these are data sets like the uh, the general social survey, survey, the PSID, the ACS, the CPS, things like that. Um, we're not super interested in those, uh, part, mostly for folks who are uh, not early career scholars. Um, so that uh, there is the asterisk there that generally does not apply to both our dissertation research grants and our pipeline grants competition, where we sort of understand that uh, early career folks uh, maybe don't have the funding to pay for access to uh, to data. So they are using those publicly available data sets. Uh, similarly, if you are doing something more interesting, like uh, matching one of those data sets to something else or doing something uh uh, doing something unique to these publicly available data sets, we could still be of interest in that. We could still be interested in that project, and I would encourage you to reach out to us. Um, across all of our programs and uh, funding priorities, uh, we don't have restrictions based on uh, the citizenship of the investigator. Uh, we just want the research to be U.S. focused. The only time we have a restriction in terms of uh, where you are at, at, at it, what institution or anything like that is that for our dissertation research grants program, we require that you be at a U.S. institution. For any of our other programs, you can be at an international institution, and that's fine. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So just uh, quickly, uh, uh, we, we are not currently accepting all program areas at every LOI deadline. Uh, so at the upcoming October 29th deadline, which uh, for funding decisions in June, uh, we are accepting our inequality program, our future of work program, and the one with the long title, which is that affirmative action initiative. At the next deadline in March, we are accepting uh, LOIs in our behavioral science and decision making program, our race, ethnicity, and immigration program, and our immigration and immigrant immigration and immigration immigrant integration program. Sorry, there's a typo on that slide. Uh, but um, I do want you to note that these program area restrictions only apply to our regular research grants, not our dissertation research grants, and not our pipeline grants, where we accept things across our program areas. Okay, so now we're going to briefly go over our eligibility requirements for the research grants. Um, as a as Stephen mentioned before, the next LOI deadline is going to be October 29th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so the first uh, requirement is that anyone who applies um, a PI or co-PI must have a, or must be PhD holders. Um, they, you can apply for a grant of up to one to two years, and these grants are typically separated into two buckets, uh, either presidential grants and trustee grants. Um, the biggest difference with these is presidential grants are $75,000 with no indirects um, and lower, and the final decision upon which presidential grants are approved is made by the president of the foundation, uh, Sheldon Denzinger. Uh, trustee grants, on the other hand, are up to two hundred thousand dollars, so seventy five thousand to two hundred thousand, with fifteen percent interests. And the final funding decision um, made for trustees is our trustee grants are made by our board of trustees um, at three three board meetings uh, in a year. Um, the research grant is a two step application process. We'll go into more detail about this two-step uh, two application process, but basically 
um, you start with a four page LOI single spaced. Um, and then if invited, you will submit a full proposal, which will include further documents, including um, including up to 20 page um, proposal, your budget, your budget justification, um, a reviewer response comments. Um, so through all the application process, um, we do have reviewers or external reviewers review for us. And if invited, you have to respond to their comments. Um, and if necessary, you know, any survey measures and all that stuff, depending on your project, of course. Um, and also to note any references, survey instruments, whatever, those do not count towards the page limit. So um, just as a FYI, because we get that question quite a lot. Um, we have three deadlines a year in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, funds for summer salary, funds could include summer salary data and assistant research assistance. Um, data and code used in the analysis must be clearly and precisely documented. Um, so we really emphasize, especially at the LOI stage, that you focus on um, on the research methods. So and give us an idea of what you're studying, because otherwise, you know, if if you go into too much detail on other things, then we don't really understand what is the point. So we really want to understand that. Um, and if you are doing experiments, all experiments must be pre-registered. Now we'll go into our review cycle. So after you've submitted your application, which is uh, for LOIs, that'll be October 29th, 2 p.m. Uh, it goes through a couple weeks of internal staff review where we um, review your application for, is it a good fit for the foundation's funding priorities at this moment? Is it at an appropriate stage? Um, so if you're almost done with the work and you just want funds for writing it up, that's not something we usually fund. Or if it's a little bit too preliminary, we want you to come back maybe later with some pilot data. Um, that's also something we're looking for. Based on the results of that internal review, we send some of our LOIs to external peer review, um, where we send it to uh, reviewers who give us feedback and comments. Uh, if the reviews are positive, we return those reviews for you to you along with an invitation to submit a full proposal. We'll return it to you at least a month before um, the full proposal deadline, uh, which will be on February 19th in 2025. Uh, when you submit your full proposal, you'll submit that 20 page proposal, your budget, your budget justification, supporting documentation, as well as a response to the review comments on your LOI. It will go back out for peer review, mostly to the same reviewers who reviewed the LOI. Uh, pending the results of that, you'll be asked to respond to reviewer comments. And then if it's a trustee level proposal, it will be reviewed by the RSF advisory committees on the subjects on the, in the program areas to which you submitted, program area to which you submitted, or it will be reviewed by um, our president uh, if it's a presidential level grant. So fund so applications that are submitted at this upcoming deadline, uh, the decisions will be made timed to the June 2025 Board of Trustees meeting with an early start date, the earliest possible start date of August 2025. Okay, so our next uh, topic is going to be about our research or early career research grants. Um, these are relatively new initiatives. Uh, the first is going to be the pipeline grants. Um, our next deadline for the pipeline pipeline grant will be October twenty second at uh, at two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eligibility for the pipeline grant is that you must be an assistant professor at lecturer with a PhD post 2014 um, and never received a, a research grant from the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, if, however, you received a small grant like a dissertation research grant in the past, you are still eligible. Um, we're more concerned about the larger grants, our trustee or presidential level grants, then unfortunately, no. Um, the pipeline grants are one-year grants. 
of up to thirty-five to fifty thousand um, dollars. And at the time of your uh, when you submit your application, you do not need to submit a budget. Um, at the most, you could write one to two sentences in your in your uh, proposal describing how you would like to spend that money. But you don't have to go into further detail. If if we we will eventually ask for that if you are invited to submit um, more documentation. Um, and just to clarify further, the 35,000 limit is for individual um, researchers. For teams, you can receive $50,000 towards your uh, pipeline grant. <clears throat> uh, the pipeline grant is a one-step application process. Again, we'll be going over this shortly. Um, but at the time of submission, you must submit a, a seven-page single-space proposal uh, detailing your your project. Um, and again, we want to hear more about the research methods um, and, and its applicability towards the literature and your CV. Um, and again, I want to emphasize one to two sentences at most about your budget. Uh, it is a limited space and we want to make sure that you can provide more detail about your project and the research methods um, so you don't need to submit anything about a budget at that time, at the time of submission. Uh, funds for the pipeline grants can be used towards summer salary, um, data collection, research assistance, uh, course buyouts, conference travel. Um, the unique part about the pipeline grants is that it includes a mentorship component. So um, in the application, um, or there should be a part that you can request or you can make recommendations on mentorship or mentors. And we will do our best to uh, match you with a mentor that um, that is relevant to your topic um, and, and, uh, and, and can provide you the best feedback relating to your topic and to your further career growth. Um, and at the end, so uh, since this is a one year rant, uh, at the end of that year cycle, there is a capstone conference where we will invite um, pipeline grantees from the last cohort to present their topics um, at whatever stage it could be. It doesn't necessarily have to be finished, but we do like want to hear what stage that you guys are at in terms of your research. And even if it is an unfinished project, it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to network and also get feedback on your ongoing project. The next uh, project or grants that I would like to discuss is the dissertation research grant. This program is directed towards PhD students. And the next deadline is gonna be February 4th, 2025 uh, with the 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, these are also a one-year grant of up to $15,000 for students who are at the uh, all the dissertation stage. Um, and again, this is another one-step process, which we will go over in just a second. Um, but at the time of submission, we only request a five-page single-space proposal with the CV. And again, no budget is required at that time. If you would like a one or two sentence describing how you will spend that money is is fine, but you don't need to add more to that. Um, the funds for the dissertation research grant could be used towards participant fees, data collection, transcriptions, lab fees, and there's a stipend of up to uh, $7,500. Um, and that could also be spent on things like transportation or, or um, rent. Um, <clears throat> Also, again, I want to clarify as well that uh, your references and your tables or survey data, um, survey instruments, just like with the research grants, are not counted towards the page limit. Um, so next. Uh, the so next, in addition oh, sorry. Um, so in addition to our uh, research grants and our early career grants, we have a couple of other funding mechanisms. 
Uh, the first are our visiting fellowships. Uh, we have two programs for this, visiting scholars and visiting researchers. Uh, these are typically for scholars, three or more years post PhD. Um, they are a one-step ap application process. You submit to us a five-page single-spaced proposal with your CV. Uh, for visiting scholars, it's a position that comes with funding. Uh, so you spend one or two semesters at, an, uh, at RSF's offices in New York City. For an in-residence fellowship, your uh, typical projects are you're working on a book project, you're working on articles if you're, in, uh, if you're not in a book discipline. Uh, you are uh, in an academic community with the fellow with the fellow scholars, um, giving seminars and feedback to your uh, to the other members of your cohort. Um, and the next deadline for this is June twenty fifth, twenty twenty five, for residents in the twenty twenty six twenty twenty seven academic year. Our visiting researcher program, on the other hand, is not a funded position. However, you do still get an office space uh, uh, in, at RSF and you can stay in the apartments uh, that we offer to our fellows. Uh, it can be a shorter in-residence period than visiting scholars. Uh, so you can come for a month, uh, half a year, a semester. Uh, and the next deadline for this is May, 2025 for residents at some time in the next academic year. So September, 2025 through June of 2026. Lastly, RSF has a journal called the Russell Sage Foundation Journal of the Social Sciences, which is open access, interdisciplinary, topic-based and peer reviewed. You can check out some of our recent articles, uh, sorry, sorry, some of our recent issues um, and calls for articles at rsfjournal.org. Uh, so unlike our core research grants, our pipeline grants, dissertation research grants, and fellowships all undergo a one-step review process. So once the deadline passes, they undergo internal staff review as discussed previously. Uh, and then based on the results of that, they go out for external peer review. Uh, you get feedback uh, and we'll ask you to respond to reviewer comments. Um, and then they are re your response, your original application uh, will be uh, reviewed by RSF's advisory committee on that program. And then it goes for board or presidential approval uh, based on uh, our fellows are approved by the board, our pipeline and dissertation research grants as they're below, as they're in amounts below $75,000 are approved by our president. Okay, um, now we're going to go over our reviewers and their role in the application process. So uh, the first step that in, that any of our programs go through is that there is an internal screening. Um, this is done by our um, program staff um, or program officers and senior officers. Um, and again, they just kind of see if those projects are a fit with the foundation's priorities, and if they are also submitting their application using the guidelines. So <clears throat> we kind of run the screen and say, is basically this is a desk reject, this is yes or no. If a project moves past that internal uh, initial review, we send it out to external reviewers, um, depending on which project, it could be one or two rounds of external reviews. Um, these are senior scholars who uh, are typically senior scholars, you know, all have PhDs. Um, and since the Russell Sage Foundation is an interdisciplinary research foundation, likewise, your reviewers are going to be interdisciplinary. So you may have an economist, uh, a sociologist, um, and historian reading reviews for or making reviews on one project. Uh, depending on what that is, but we will do our best to match uh, external reviewers based on their expertise level, what type of um, research they do, so if they are quantitative, qualitative, or they're mixed methods, um, and what their area of expertise is as well. Um, after those 
external reviews at the LOI proposal stage. Um, if the project is moved forward, it goes to, and also depending on if it is a presidential or trustee, um, if it's presidential, it just goes um, for approval or not to our president. At the trustee level though, there is an additional round of, of, um, of reviewing. Um, and just as a reminder, trustee grants are grants that are 75,000 to $200,000. Um, so at that stage, this is the advisory committee stage where we have a standing committee of interdisciplinary experts that Russell Sage recruits. And they take the whole, the project in whole. So how has the project improved from its LOI stage to its proposal? How the PIs may have responded to reviewer comments at both the LOI and proposal stage. Um, and they make a decisions on whether or not a project is moved forward uh, for funding consideration by the Board of Trustees, um, possibly uh, depending on how they feel the, the project has moved along and, and the PI's responses, they may reject or they may even request that that project be uh, revised and resubmitted. Um, and the final reviewers for trustee grants is of course going to be our board of trustees who make the final decisions on what projects are are funded that are over 75,000. So why would a LOI be declined at the initial screening? So there are a few reasons. Uh, and these are typically, uh, the ones that sit on the screen are typically the ones that are the usual reason why things are not selected. So first off is that it's not a Russell Sage funding priority. Um, since we are a small but mighty, I would say, um, foundation, um, we are limited in how many uh, funding or project that we can fund in a cycle. And we we do have to cut out some of that that we feel are not really uh, in par or really a priority, especially towards our program areas. Um, and sometimes that can include things that we feel are a routine analysis, um, something that is not US focused. Um, um, Russell Sage also does not support things like program evaluations, operational support, animal studies, documentaries. Those are just things that we flat out do not um, support. Um, and another big thing, uh, we don't fund projects that are primarily health outcomes or are around issues of educational uh, curriculum. And the reason why we don't do that, again, is because we are a small foundation and there are much larger foundations that have much more funding that can focus on these areas and, and can give out more grants than we can. So we like to focus on things that are a little more outside the box. Uh, another reason is that maybe a project is has good potential, but it's just not quite there. It's a little too preliminary. So maybe we just feel that um, you don't have the access to the data and what has been described as has not fully been well developed yet. Um, it could also be that the feasibility of your project hasn't barely been shown without pilot data. So and if you do have pilot data, that, that is useful to add in your LOIs. Um, and some other reasons why uh, your LOI may not be, or may be uh, rejected at its initial stages. Um, there could be just lack of clarity in the research design. Um, it could be not very well organized uh, or the space permitted is not uh, used well, or we could simply tell that the grant is, has been copy and pasted from another grant. You know, uh, we try and tailor your research project to what we're also looking for as well. Um, so it's very helpful if you review our, our, our RFPs. Um, and sometimes Russell Sage prioritizes research projects with strong descriptive or causal designs.
So when we're sending your application out for review, we're asking them to our reviewers to consider five questions during the review process. Uh, these questions are straight from our proposal review questionnaire um, at the LOI stage. It's a little bit less structured, but uh, we're asking them the same general ideas. Uh, are the main questions important and compelling? Are your questions and hypotheses clearly stated? Are they appropriately supported in terms of prior theory and empirical work? So is your work, are you, are you asking interesting questions? Are you well grounded in uh, the literature, both from your own discipline and across disciplines? Um, are you using an appropriate research design data and methods that will address the questions raised? Do you have enough do you have enough power if you're making a causal claim? We ask if the reviewers think there's any additional expertise necessary to carry out the project or uh, if the team is well qualified. We ask what is the likely contribution of the project to the social sciences? Uh, is this more of an incremental thing or is this a bigger leap forward to significantly advance the literature? Um, and result or or result in a novel data set. Uh, and then just a broad question, do you have anything else to add that you think would strengthen or improve the project? Um, we do have a we do prohibit reviewers from inputting any content from LOIs, proposals, applications, anything that comes across their desk um, into generative AI tools such as Chat GPT. Uh, finally, some tips and suggestions as you're putting together your application before we open it up to our question and answer session. Uh, number one, make sure the project is a good fit for RSF. Take some time to go over our RFPs and our funding priorities on our website, as well as maybe go look at some of the things that we've funded in the past uh, to make sure that it's a good fit. That's the number one reason why uh, applications don't make it through the initial screen. Uh, second, make sure your research questions are driving the proposal, not the data. So your your research questions are, uh, at, you know, asking, uh, you know, asking of the data things that are interesting and things that can be answered. Um, we want you to balance the proposal narrative between conciseness and detail. We know your LOIs and your uh, even the pipeline and early career applications are short. Um, but we want you to give us enough detail so that we can evaluate the research design. Uh, and in doing that, we want you to provide sufficient information for reviewers to evaluate the appropriateness of the methods. A lot of times reviewers come back to us and they say, hey, like there wasn't a ton of uh, there wasn't a ton of in this proposal for me to evaluate. Uh, if you're asked to provide more detail uh, or just to respond to reviews, please do so seriously, graciously and in depth. Uh, we don't want you to overpromise or exaggerate what the project will do. Um, that's just uh, that's just not necessary. Uh, lastly, as you're putting together your budget um, and your and your uh, project's design, please involve your office of sponsored projects early. Uh, make sure your budget is reasonable, allowable, and allocable according to RSF budget guidelines. Uh, you can find these on our website as well. Uh, and you can reach out with any questions that you may have about these guidelines. Um, and lastly, overall, check our website, check our FAQs, check our example LOIs and proposals, uh, review our guidelines, and please stay on top of our deadlines. Uh, on this note, we accept our applications through our online platform called Flux, and please register if you do not already have an account more than 48 hours in advance as we process registrations by hand. Um, we're here as a resource for you before and ap after an application, so don't be afraid to use us. Okay, now we're going to open up the floor for questions. Um, yes, so, so uh, we've been uh, busy answering a lot of questions in the text, so uh, you can go ahead and scroll through previously submitted questions to see if your question has been answered. Uh, we're happy to answer any more questions in this time. Um, so uh, I'll take a I, I do see a question here about uh, where we can find example proposals, and I will link that in the chat for us. 
Um, you can find that on our website under writing tips. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there is a link that says sample LOIs and proposals. That is where you will find samples. Sorry, I was finding that. Uh, so uh, I'll answer the question about our pilot studies eligible for funding. Uh, the answer is sort of, uh, it depends. Uh, if you are a more senior scholar and you are applying for one of our larger research grants, the answer is probably no. Uh, but if you are a junior scholar applying to one of our early career programs like the pipeline grants competition or like the dissertation research grants uh, program, then the answer is probably yes. So it's an it depends. Uh, the earlier you are in your sort of academic career or your research career, we're more likely uh, to be uh, open to funding pilot studies. Um, new this year, uh, particularly for the pipeline grants, we are particularly interested in pilot RCTs. So if you are an assistant professor eligible for the pipeline grants, looking to pilot an RCT, I would encourage you to apply um, as we have some co-funding from uh, JPAL to, to fund some of those. Uh, I also wanted to provide some clarity on a question that we received. Um, so the question is, uh, can you talk about the 50000 to 75000 cap for presidential grants? Would any qualitative research be eligible for up to 75000 presidential grants? So if you review our budget guidelines on our website, it does state that the presidential grant, grants are capped at 50000 However, uh, PIs may request up to 75000 and still be considered a presidential if the, pro if the proposed research project has uh, special needs for gathering data, uh, so in that case, qualitative research, um, gaining access to restricted use data, um, or if the, if the project has multiple uh, PIs. So, uh, if if an, if your project falls under any of those categories, then you can be considered uh, or request a, a presidential grant of up to seventy five thousand dollars. Great. Um, I'll answer a couple of questions that came in about the pipeline grants. Uh, so first, uh, can you list co investigators? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, and if you are both. Uh, eligible parties and you you are eligible for, if you are both assistant professors, let's say, you can apply for the higher amount. Um, uh, relatedly, if you are submitting as a team, you only need to submit one application. You do not both need to submit. Um, uh, so you can uh, you can list uh, your team, your teammates on on the application there. Um, as to whether we need a letter of support, uh, that sort of depends. Um, we, we don't require letters of support, but if you have letters of support, you can always uh, upload them as part of the, uh, like an appendix. Um, and it sort of, in who that is from sort of matters. Uh, if it's, uh, if you're proposing to do some uh, qualitative project where you need access to a community or, or, or some, some group, and you have made inroads with an organization that has access to that, a letter of support like that shows uh, shows us that you've done a lot of the pre work and it's uh, and that you uh, that they will actually talk to you or you will be able to demonstrate pro project feasibility. So things like that are good. If you're just talking about a letter of support from your university, um, we don't require that, but it's definitely allowable. Um, and. Uh, we do not, there's a question about whether we require causal claims uh, for our affirmative action grants. Uh, currently across all of our programs, we do not require causal, causal claims. Uh, I know that some other, other foundations require that. We are interested in descriptive work. Uh, we are interested in qualitative work. We are interested in all sorts of those things. Uh, so yeah, we just want, it, what, we, what we really want is that the research question matches the research methodology methodology being proposed. So if you are making a causal claim and then proposing a non-causal method, that's that's where we would have an issue. Um, we uh, There's a question about course buyouts. Uh, so 
uh, for the pipeline grants, we specifically allow course buyouts. For all of our other grants, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and uh, that sort of depends on the teaching load of the PI. It depends on maybe the timeliness of the project. I can imagine a project, say, centered around an election where you would like to be out in the field during that fall semester. And then we, maybe we would consider a course buyout for that, something like that as well. Um, Oh, it, there's a more clarity on the letters of support question. There is no, we don't, we don't have a way that letters of support can be submitted confidentially. Uh, we do not, which is why we do not require them. Uh, so if, uh, if that's part of that, then we don't, I would just, you wouldn't even have to submit it because we don't require it. Um, I just want to ask, answer the question from, uh, regarding the, Co-PIs and whether or not they have to have PhDs. Uh, yes, they they have to have PhDs, uh, or you must be a PhD holder for research grants. Um, also, I want to clarify something. This is more of a technical thing. Uh, if you have co-PIs on your on your project, um, and you are from separate institutions, so let's say somebody uh, you have a PI that's submitted from Howard University, and somebody else is at uh, UC Berkeley, the the co-PI from UC Berkeley will not be able to view the document or in, in flux. Um, but if you want them to have access, uh, I please email us and we will work with you on that. That's just kind of like a more technical thing in the background. But um, if you if you're questioning like, oh, why is can't my co-PI see it? And they also have a flux account. Well, that's why. Um, but uh, it's just that if you are from separate institutions, then you cannot see what someone else has, basically. Oh, no. Um, so I, I see a question here. Influx system, where do I list co-PI uh, and the appendices? Um, so in the application Influx, there, there's going to be a question that asks, do you have co-PIs? You will say yes or no. If yes, then there's going to be a drop down menu and you could list who your co PIs are. So you'll put, you give them the name and their emails. And uh, so it's it's in the application itself. Um, and the appendices, I'm assuming that is part of your documentation. So, so part of your LOI, uh, there is a section towards the bottom of the application where you can upload your LOI, your CV, um, you can have the appendices as a separate document, or you could have it as one document with your LOI, again, because we do not count appendices or um, references, tables, whatever. We don't count that towards the page limit. So you could have it as a separate document, or you could have it together in one. Um, I'm seeing a question about uh, receiving feedback if the proposal is not accepted. Uh, yes, if you've received comments, you'll receive the reviewer's feedback uh, with a notification of, of your rejection. Um, if you haven't received comments, uh, you're welcome to email us at programs at rsage.org um, for more clarity on our decision. Um. Yeah, to the question about how many pipeline grants are funded each cycle, we we fund between 15 and 20 pipeline grants each cycle. Uh, and uh, our, it's, it's noisy for the actual funding rate over time uh, that we, because it completely depends on how many apply. But over the past five years, it's our, our funding rate for the pipeline grants has been in the like 14 to 16 percent uh, versus our regular research grants where the funding rate waffles between seven and 11%. Uh, so the pipeline grants have a higher funding rate, uh, particularly for assistant professors. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, there's a question about whether teammates can be, team members can be from other institutions, even if they're not full co-PIs. Yes, that's that's fine. We, you can make a subgrant to another institution and just have it be even like a research assistant. That's all, that's, that's perfectly allowable. But um, 
I would say that uh, a lot of these questions about KPIs and construction of teams is distracting from, I think, what matters more to us when we're evaluating projects, which is really, we want to see as many details about the research design. Uh, that's that's what really matters. Uh, and so if you are filling up space in the proposal, talking about your team and their qualifications and uh, and the budget and things like that, especially at the early LOI stage or the initial application for the pipeline grants or the dissertation grants, um, that's just taking away space that we could use that we actually uh, would like you to fill with more information on the research design. Um, a lot of those issues about budget, about co-PIs, about teams can be addressed later um, after we've sort of gotten through the peer review process. Uh, I also like to highlight that as part of the application process, you are required to submit CVs. Um, so again, just to em emphasize, we're, we will know your qualifications. We will see your qualifications in your CVs. Um, so again, focus on, on the research and the, the methods because um, the other things, it, it will just be redundant information and that will take away from the limited space that you have to provide us with uh, details about your project. Um, there's a question about whether nurses are funded through the pipeline. We generally don't fund nurses. Um, so uh, if if you have a specific exception to that about uh, why a nurse would be doing research that would be relevant to the foundation, please send us an email, email at programs at rsage.org. Um, and you can give us more details about that specific uh, progress process. I, I really encourage everyone to email us. Um, that's the best way to get project specific answers. Um, that way we don't have to uh, keep doing these one-off questions <laughs> on the webinar. But uh, I, I think most we've mostly handled the in inundation of the, the questions that have come through. Uh, thank you everyone for, for uh, coming to this webinar. Um, it will be posted on our website within a couple of days. Um, and uh, uh, please email programs at our stage with other questions. Um, if you have an abstract or some short little bit about your proposal or your project, that really helps give us some context. Um, things like that are, are really, really, uh, really, really good. Uh, the longer you wait, the closer you get to the deadline, the harder it is for us to really answer things well. Uh, so the earlier you do it, the better. <laughs>